This afternoon, we are very pleased to have with us Lori Crumpacker, historian and professor at Simmons College. I am so happy to be here. I was here, oh, many years ago, talking about Simmons College, my alma mater and my home institution. And the audience is always wonderful here. And I am honored to be back again on a very different subject. So I'm going to launch right into my little lecture because I don't know exactly how much time it will take and I want to leave time for your questions and comments at the end. So I'm talking about Sarah Prince, obviously. Let's see what she looked like. So there, there's Sarah and she is... Um, in a painting by, of course, John Singleton Copley. Don't we all wish we had him to paint us? And she looks both serious and very, very lovely. And that is how she comes off as you read her meditations. She was born in 1728, the, the third daughter and fourth child of Thomas Prince and Deborah Denny Prince. Her father, Thomas, was the evangelical associate pastor and minister of this Old South Meeting House for close to 50 years. The meditations mentioned in the title of this talk were written by Sarah in the 1750s and early 1760s. And like the few other extant works of this sort, they tell us a great deal more than we might expect about the lives of religious women in the mid-18th century. Now let's see if I can get my other... There's her dad, Thomas Prince, looking quite friendly as he was supposed to be. And uh, you just walk right up to him and introduce yourselves, I think. But anyway, her meditations were published in 2005 along with the spiritual meditations of Esther Burr's mother. Now, who is Esther Burr? She's the other woman I will be discussing today. She was the third of 11 children of Sarah Pierpont Edwards and Jonathan Edwards, the famous preacher of the 18th century. And Esther was Sarah's best friend. But after Esther married Aaron Burr and moved to New Jersey, she and Sarah agreed to keep a letter journal for each other. That is a, a record of what was going on in their own experience as if they were in conversation with each other. Now, only Esther's letters have survived, but they reveal almost as much about Sarah as Sarah's own meditations. And that's why I'm talking about both today. Now, as I said, the meditations were published. They, for a long time, they weren't published. You could read them in manuscript at the Boston Public Library, which I did many years ago. But they were published in 2005, along with the spiritual meditations of Esther Burr's mother, Sarah Edwards. <coughs> and the meditations of Sarah Prince were published in 2005. Here they are, I just told you about them. And the journal of Esther Burr was published in 1984 and edited by Carol Carlson and myself. And they're both very revealing. The, today I want to focus them as a focus on them as a window on religious life. Aha, uh -huh, there's Sarah Edwards. Religious life on marriage, work, and family, and on friendship. They were favorite subjects in the writings of these two women. First, about religion. It is no coincidence that both of these women were evangelical co congregationalists or latter-day Puritans. Sarah, of course, as we've already said, was the daughter of one of New England's favorite pe preachers of the Great Awakening. Thomas Prince was popular. He was a warm and friendly pastor of this church. In her eulogy for him, 
Sarah describes her father as a pastor, both able, vigilant, active, and laborious, faithful, and wise. What a wonderful pastor. She calls him a spiritual father and pastor for his children, as well as his parishioners. And she credits him with saving her soul by guiding her through numerous religious crises and conversion experiences. Now, a word about conversions is perhaps needed here. From the 17th century Puritan teachings well into the next century, an essential element of church membership was an either a public or a private statement of faith. And that needed to include a humble confession of one's utter sinfulness and an admission that only God's grace might save one. I intentionally say might because a tenet of Puritan Calvinism was that one could never be sure that one was among the elect. Yet, persons should always endeavor to live as though they were blessed by God's grace. The crisis of conversion was repeated a number of times sometimes during one's lifetime. And one of the most famous models is here on the screen of such a conversion experience was that written about Jonathan Edwards' wife, Sarah Pierpont Edwards. Remember, I just spoke to you about Jonathan and Sarah Edwards as being the parents of Esther Edwards Burr. Now, Sarah Edwards in 1742 was feeling exhausted by the constant demands of her children, she had 11 of them, and her duties as a minister's wife. According to her husband, Jonathan Edwards, at one point she simply retired to her chamber in a very depressed state and after a prayerful few days emerged a new woman, having been changed, that is, converted by God's grace. Jonathan Edwards wrote about his wife's experience in his book, Some Thoughts Concerning the Present Revival of Religion. And here's a very interesting thing. Sarah Edwards' experience became a kind of template for conversion experiences, especially for women. Let's see if we can get a picture of her lovely husband. Not right. There he is. And he's writing about his wife. He's quoting her. She says, I found a degree of uneasiness in my mind at my husband's suggesting that he thought I had failed in some measure of point of prudence in a conversation I had had the day before. I was thus deeply sensible that my sins did loud, loudly call for vengeance. Just because her husband criticized her. I felt a need to be alone with God. I can imagine that, can't you? With those 11 children and her husband waiting outside. Um, I was thus deeply sensible, as I said, that my sins did call for vengeance. I felt a need to be alone with God and accordingly withdrew to my chamber. In her chamber, she found comforting passages in the Bible. And she says, I emerged knowing safety, happiness, and eternal enjoyment of God's immutable love. It is clear from this model that these women believe that a true religious experience was powerful, heartfelt, and it is not surprising that often an external event or illness or criticism by one's husband or death of a loved one might trigger similar experiences for religious women like Sarah Prince. In fact, we find similar elements repeated in the crises that Sarah Prince describes many, many times in her meditations. 
I'll read you only two such examples. In July of 1744, Sarah Prince wrote, It has pleased God to exercise me with a sore trial for these seven weeks past in the grievous sickness and death of my dear eldest sister. Debbie had apparently been unsure about her soul during most of these weeks, and only at the last moment felt her sins were forgiven. At this point, Sarah's other sister called Mercy into the chamber of the dying woman. And Sarah says, but a minute before, it had been in grievous darkness and doubt, but now was finally filled with peace and joy because the dying woman had found Christ's mercy. In another example, in January of 1756, Sarah Prince wrote, I have such a fountain of sin in me, I fear I am not a real Christian. And in another meditation of December 1756, she stated, I am a poor, fruitless, barren, sluggish soul. But by a later date, January 19th, 1757, things were changed. She then prayed, adored be the riches of free grace. God has taken me near to him this month and given me glimpses of his glory and some tastes of his love. These are the ups and downs of evangelical Christianity and Sarah Prince exemplified them in her meditations. What is surprising and rather painful to me at any rate in Sarah Prince's meditations is the frequency of this crises that she rec records. What is also painful to read is of the extreme suffering, both mental and physical, that she experienced so often. Editor Dorothy Baker of the volume that includes her meditations wonders if we are reading something like an account of dramatic mood swings, although of course that is not what they would have been called in Sarah's day. In her journal, Esther Burr reports similar experiences, although not so frequently. Perhaps she did not have time for as much reflection and as much meditation because she was raising two young children. What is heartening in both Sarah's and Esther's accounts is the way that Sundays, Sundays at the meeting house, often brought relief, as they would say, at the Lord's table. It also helped to hear particularly moving sermons by favorite preachers like Thomas Prince and Jonathan Edwards and the famous George Whitfield or some other gifted speaker. After he also healing was reading others' accounts of these experiences. For example, in the hymns of Isaac Watts or in David Brainerd's diary. <coughs> Now, while religion is always the main theme of Sarah Prince's meditations, as would be expected in these very personal and private prayers and writings, Esther Burr's letters to her friend, which are responses to Sarah's now lost letters, range among a number of other subjects. Duty and work are all important to who, as a young mother, was always on call. And as a minister's wife, she needed to entertain visiting divines. And her pastoral duties also frequently included visiting sick and impoverished parishioners. Indeed, she confessed at one point to Sarah Prince, visiting is the hardest work that I do. 
Sarah Prince also had pastoral duties, and sometimes she resented these as well. She was especially annoyed if a visit's discussion turned to what she called foolish topics, topics such as fashion and gossip. And her work became much more demanding, as we shall see, after her marriage, when household and social duties sometime left her little or no time for prayer. Also time-consuming was Sarah's supervision of the religious states of her servant's soul. Some were even called family, and she found that their souls often needed saving. And family was another vitally important topic for Sarah and Esther. Sarah's meditations include her responses to at least four very sad events. The deaths of her sister Deborah, which we already heard about, her father, her friend Esther's husband, Aaron Burr, and Esther Burr's death as well. We learn from her meditations that Sarah found her friend's husband, Aaron Burr's death, in October of 1757, extremely difficult to accept. Let's see if we can find Aaron Burr here. Oh, there's Esther. Her picture is not anywhere near as clear, and if you want to know a story about how Carol Carlson and I finally found a, her picture, I'll tell you later. But uh, it's not as clear as the other pictures, and it certainly isn't by John Singleton <coughs> Copley. But there's Esther Burr, and there's Aaron Burr, a very handsome man. And as you probably realize, he was the father of the famous Aaron Burr, who, in a duel, shot Alexander Hamilton. But this Aaron Burr, Aaron Burr Sr., was a minister trained under Jonathan Edwards, who became the first president of Princeton College. He was an inspiring minister himself. Um, so as I was saying, Sarah's meditations include her responses to four people's deaths. And Aaron Burr Sr. is the first one, no, the second one who is included in these meditations. We learn that she found her friend's husband, Aaron Burr's death, extremely difficult to accept. She wrote, God has now touched me in a new and heart-rending stroke, the death of the most useful and valuable friend, except my brother, sister, and Mrs. Burr, who, my late, dear, and firm friend, Mr. President Burr. He possessed every quality that are, is requisite in friendship. He was generous and refined and a, a person whom I will miss greatly. She says she deserves chastisement for becoming too fond of this worldly friend. And instead she should feel sorrow for the dear widow who was her friend. The next day, Sarah adds, oh, that I may get more ripened for glory, to think that I should remain secure under such a flood, those two deaths. This is a call for deep, deep abasement and repentance. My earthly comforts are one by one being taken away. I feel rebellious under the Lord's correcting hand. Lord, pardon, quicken, and sanctify me for thy dear son's sake. Now, it's interesting to think of Sarah's friendship with Aaron Burr, which sounds deep and almost romantic. Indeed, when one sees how she admires her own father her friend's and her friend's husband, it becomes easier to understand why she did not marry until relatively late in her life after her two great male supporters had died. How could anyone measure up to those models? At one point in her meditations, and this is rather interesting, Sarah does consider marriage, and she writes about it in her meditations, and she writes about it in her letters to Esther Burr. 
And at one point, she seems to be seeking divi divine advice about marriage. In April of 1757, she wrote, pleading for God's help and direction in the most important affair now pending, which must have been a marriage proposal. My inclinations, she says, are for compliance. God has called me to think seriously of this charge. Tis a plain duty, <clears throat> and the finger of God is seen plainly in it. Now, then we look back and we see letters going back and forth between Sarah and Esther and Aaron Burr, asking, sit with Sarah asking Esther and Aaron's advice about marriage <clears throat> and about a particular suitor. At that time, Esther chided Sarah because Sarah called married couples poor, fettered folk. And Esther warned her that no man likes a woman the better for being shy or dissembling. Esther concluded with advice from her own parents, Jonathan and Sarah Edwards. And that advice was, in a marriage partner, the most important thing is, now you're going to say it is the religion or the piety of the, your partner. No, that isn't what Esther and, and uh, uh, that isn't what Sarah and Jonathan Edwards say. They say, if upon mature deliberation you cannot think of spending your days with that gentleman, with complacency and delight, say no. And Sarah did say no that time. But more challenges were to come after Aaron Burr's death because Esther Burr died in April of 1758, shortly after her father, Jonathan Edwards, died. All had been inoculated for the smallpox, and all may have died from the inoculation. Apparently what happened was sometimes the inoculation, which is, was with live, I'm looking at my infectious disease specialist husband, it was with live virus, is, is that correct? With live pox, cowpox. Anyway, sometimes it gave people uh, the swelling of the throat and caused their death. And in all three cases of um, immunization in, in uh, Esther's family, that seems to have been the case. But anyway, Sarah's eulogy for Esther makes the importance of their friendship clear. She says, God, in holy and awful severity, has again struck at one of my principal springs of earthly comfort in taking from me the beloved of my heart, my dearest friend, Mrs. Burr. She was dear to me as the apple of my eye. The God of nature had furnished her with all that one would, could, des could desire in a friend. Her natural powers were superior to most women. Her knowledge and wit was extensive, and grace appeared in her exalted above all. She was a tender daughter and wife, mother and mistress, on every and every loving and lovely sister and friend. And she was mine. That's what Sarah says. But she is gone, fled this world forever, prayed and panted for a better world. My way is hidden. Oh, were I ready for his summons too. Esther's death leads us to think about how very preoccupied these evangelical women were with friendship. In an early letter to Sarah, Esther put it this way, I have not one sister I can write so freely to as to you, the sister of my heart. These women believed that friendship was a religious as well as a social duty. And the friendships of these women are precursors to what Carol Smith Rosenberg calls the establishment of a, quote, female world of love and ritual in the 19th century. The prayer groups that these evangelical 18th century women 
met in and the relationships that they had could eventually lead to discussions of many other important themes in women's lives. And uh, my co-author, co-editor and I believe that they did lead to some of the women's groups and women's movements of the 19th century. But back to Sarah. She does marry, of course, Moses Gill. Now let's see if I can show you Moses. He's a, yeah, look at him. Also by John Singleton Copley. <laughs> what does he look like? Does he look like the cat who swallowed the canary? I mean, I don't know. He certainly doesn't look as serious as that portrait of, of Sarah was. So she marries Moses Gill, a successful merchant and later short-term lieutenant governor of Massachusetts, just a few months after her father's death. This is Sarah now we're talking about. She does not give her actual marriage much room in her meditations. It's the next meditation six months after her father's death and it simply is headed Sunday, two days before marriage. So in this mood, as usual, she credits God with having led her to think of changing her state, quote, dissipating her fears and clearing up what was the path of duty. So she marries because it's the path of duty. But by April 15th, a month later, she is happy to report that God has, quote, brought her into marriage with one who I esteem as a person hopefully pious. So Moses Gill is hopefully pious. We do hope so. She hopes to walk beside him with a proper heart and to set an example of virtue and true piety. Now this is interesting. show you a picture. Uh, Moses and Sarah inherit the Prince family's large Princeton estate. Now this is the only way really that Sarah Prince was able to keep this estate in the family was to marry because she couldn't own the land or the estate but her husband could. So this is a complicated relationship, I think, legally and otherwise. But anyway, Moses and Sarah inherit the Prince family's large Princeton, Massachusetts estate. And now Sarah must supervise a staff of servants and probably some slaves whose souls she also sees as her responsibility. Without children in her life, she calls her servants her family. Yet, by December, of the first year of marriage, she is ridden with lameness and with forward ungovernable, ungodly servants. And at length she, she finds a head servant whom she hopes is pious, a pious godly woman. woman. And so she hopes that she can turn these younger servants over to this pious godly woman and she'll have some help. Yet, she says, the young servants remain thoughtless of God, their souls, their sins, and eternity. During her early marriage, Sarah is also preoccupied with something worse, the unsettled and melancholy state of this church. Here she refers to lengthy arguments in the church about settling a new minister after her father's death. So journal entries during these years of her marriage are not as frequent as before, but they are still characterized by those mood swings. On Saturday, June 1761, she reports a long season of deadness, woeful indifference and carnal temper. But the customary sure, cure came on Sunday with a solemn Sabbath and a sense of God's holiness. Through the 1760s, Sarah's meditations continue with her complaints about the cares and trifles of her life as a householder. But she also continues to speak movingly of the power of women's friendships. 
At the same time, it is clear that gender roles still prescribe separation of the sexes and that women remained relegated to private space. So I want to conclude here with two things. <coughs> I'll see if I've got time. Yes, I've got time. One is her final meditation in 1764. It's short. Remember, she's married. She's going through these religious crises. But here's what she says, and it is a really lovely meditation. God has returned me to my house. Last Saturday, I was earnest for the presence of God, Saturday again, on the approaching day, an ordinance of the Holy Supper was helped to enlargement in secret prayer and contemplations on the deep abasement and dreadful sufferings of the Son of God. I retired at dusk with sweet composure of heart to meditate, pray, and praise. Every incident was a burden that prevented my soul from fixing itself on God, but I arose early on the Lord's day and was glad at heart. Fixing my, <clears throat> it was a day set apart for him. I retired for an hour and a half. I hope I was sincere in seeking him whom I trust my soul loveth. I went with expectation to his house and table and was not disappointed. He appeared lovely in suffering, in dying. He appeared all in all to me. I gave my all to him. I think that's a beautiful passage in American prose. But I, my final conclusion is a little different. I want to conclude finally with earlier, happier days than the difficult times that Sarah had coping with the series of deaths among her family and friends in 1757, 1758, and her hard work as a married woman. I would like you to listen to another letter, this time from Esther to Sarah Prince, when Aaron Burr was on a trip from Princeton to Boston, and Esther was staying in Princeton, New Jersey. I believe she was pregnant at the time. At that time, Esther wrote to Sarah as follows. I imagine now, this evening, that Mr. Burr is at your house. Father, Jonathan Edwards, is there, and some others. You all sit in the middle room. Father has the talk. Mr. Burr has the laugh. Mr. Prince gets room to stick in a word once in a while. And the rest of you, all the women, sit and see and hear and make observations to yourselves. But when you get upstairs, you tell what you think. And you wish I was there too. Also a moving passage from a very personal letter between two friends. I wish I was there. You wish I was there too. And that's all I've got for today. <laughs> This is a genealogy if um, you want to glance at it and it sort of places people in time and helps us to figure out who's who. I'll leave it up there for a little while and ask if you have any comments or questions. I have, I have two questions. Um, one, this is a, is this a Jonathan Edwards that was, that, do you happen to know if that was the one that the Yale building was named after? Yes. 
and um, I forgot forgot my other I forgot my other question right now. Oh, um, you talk about the table of the the. They didn't have Eucharist, did they? Yes. Oh, they did. I didn't realize the Puritans had Eucharist. Uh, well, these evangelical congregationalists had a ceremony of Eucharist, dif different from the Anglican ceremony and different from the Roman Catholic ceremony, okay. but the Lord's Supper nonetheless. So they received Eucharist in some form? Uh, bread and wine. Oh, okay. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm no expert on religion, but uh, I've learned a lot from these women. Hi, this is really interesting. I was wondering, how did you get involved in this subject? Oh my, that's an interesting question. Um, well, back in the early 1980s, I was trying to, I was looking for a topic for my dissertation, my PhD dissertation at Boston University. And one of my professors suggested that I look at the journal of Esther Edwards Burr. Now at this time, the Edwards scholars, who were all men, were editing the Edwards papers, which were all at uh, Yale, in the Brainerd, uh, on the, in the Beinecke Library at Yale. So I said, oh, okay, I'll, I'll look at that. And I did look at it. I pulled it off the shelf, and I read this small book, which was the journal of Esther, was titled The Journal of Esther Edwards Burr. And it looked as though it had been written by two people, and it did not look at all authentic. So I went to the library, and I found a 1935 article in the American Quarterly by Josephine Fisher that said that it was a fraud. It was not real. It was not her real journal. But this 1935 scholar said her real journal existed and it was in the Beinecke Library at Yale. So I rushed down to Yale and there it was, still in manuscript. And nobody was interested in it. The Edwards scholars were ignoring it. It was only by Jonathan Edwards' daughter. Um, and at the same time that I arrived there, another woman, a graduate student at Yale, arrived there, Carol Carlson. And I used this for my dissertation, The Real Journal. And the two of us agreed at that point that we would both publish it together. But the Edwards scholars didn't want us to. We were just two graduate students, young women graduate students, and what right had we to, uh, you know, work with the Edwards papers? But fortunately, my advisor, David D. Hall, and her advisor, Edmund Morgan, were well-known Edwards scholars. They went to the other gentleman and said, let these women do it. They're better qualified, really, than you are to work with this journal. So we got to do it. We were very fortunate. <laughs>